here, and it's always my pleasure to have folks with Jamaican roots see what they're doing and changing the world. And do we have one for you today? We're going to be interviewing Mr. Alex Wheatley. He spent most of his childhood in Shirley Oaks Children's Home at 16. He became the founder of a crucial, a crucial rocker sound system. His DJ name was Yardman Irie. He wrote lyrics <laughs> about everyday life in Braxton Bay. But in 1980, while living in this in the social service hostel in in Bristol, South London, he participated in the 81 Bristol riots and aftermath. And there, he found himself in, in some issues, in some challenges. He was sentenced, and he went to um, the, the lockup. But there he found himself in a big way. He educated himself while there. He read authors such as Shetza Imes, Richard Wright, L.R. R. James, and John Steinle. He also had a recipe and as a cellmate that encouraged him and actually saw his potential, encouraged him to start reading books and to care about his education. And so his writing started. He writes about books with characters with himself in it, but also those from East Ark Lake, characters such as Yardman Irie and Jane Nelson. Today we're going to be looking at him about one of his most recent work. And I'll let my colleague, Janice, take it away and get you that detail. Janice, here we go. Thank you so much, Chris. Alex. Hi. Alex. I'm so Hi, happy. I can hear you. Well, we are. You can hear me? Hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Loud oh, and clear. okay. <laughs> We're so happy to have you because I am a fan of yours. I've, I've known about you from East Acre Lane. That's where I first learned about you. And I wasn't disappointed with East Thursday Lane, and I definitely enjoyed Homegirls. Because one thing okay. I like about your writing is that it keeps you interested. <laughs> you know, one of those page turners, yeah. you know, you're, you're like, hmm, you know. And what I like about your work is that you know I can actually visualize it, and then and then I, yeah. I think when you do something like that, it 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 stays in your memory a lot longer, you know. Yeah. So you have a high degree of sensitivity to you. What can you share about your roots? <laughs> my roots. Um, mm -hmm. My parents were both Jamaican. Mm -hmm. um, my mother. Uh, she was married in Jamaica, but she um, came over to the UK in the early 1960s. Mm -hmm. My father had been in the UK from Jamaica. He arrived in 1954. Mm -hmm. And so um, the two of them had an affair that produced me. Um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, my mother could not look after me uh, once I was a very young baby. She had to return to Jamaica to um, her children out there. So um, my father, um, he struggled with me in my early days, but mm -hmm. he could not cope. And so I was placed into um, social services care. Mm -hmm. And my father, he returned to um, Old Harbor where he grew up. And so really? I grew up alone. Yes. And oh, so I'm, I'm... I grew up. Say that again. Um, my mom's from Old Harbor. <laughs> All right. So, yeah. yeah, my father lived in Marley Mount, if you know Marley Mount. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yes. He, he, yes. So um, I, I grew up not knowing my family. So I was in the Shirley Oaks Children's Home Village from the age of two and a half to um, 15 and a half. And oh, wow. when I left there, when I left there, I went to Brixton, yeah. and I lived in a social services hostel in Brixton. And at mm -hmm. the time, Brixton was um, heavily dominated by Jamaicans. Yeah. Uh, you could hear the reggae music everywhere. <laughs> you you everywhere. see um, people locking up their hair and things like that. It was that. the hub. And so, yeah. that's yeah, right. I, it was I, the hub. I remember when I, I remember when I went to England for the first time. And then I met my relatives for the first time, you know, my British relatives. Yeah. 
And it was interesting because, I mean, I'm like, what do you mean you're born here? You sound like a Jamaican. I mean, I literally thought I was, I was around yeah. Jamaica, Jamaica, you know? So I yeah. wasn't compared to my other relatives who had the British eye, like you, you know, they have the British eye. But the other ones, the ones who grew up in Brixton, yeah. it was like, <laughs> they spoke better Papua than me, you know? That's you, right. Um, yeah. W- so. Yeah, that was like it, a mini Jamaica. It, that was like an eye opener. It was. It, it definitely <laughs> was because me being um, raised by um, mainly white people, I couldn't even understand the patois in my mm. early days. Yeah, I, I had to was just really shocked. pay attention. Yeah. But you know what? Um, I fell in love with the reggae music. I love the reggae music. Of you course. Know, artists that's, that's, like that's why, Dennis Brown. That's, yeah, so that's why reggae is played in, um, literally, it's the only Caribbean genre that's played right. in every continent. What do you recall about your your entry and time at the Shirley Oaks home? Well, I was very young. You know, I was only two and a half years of age, but as I got a little older, it was a very, it was a very abusive environment. Mm-hmm. Um, there was sexual abuse, there was violent abuse, there was mental abuse. Wow. You know, it was it was a nightmare. It was like hell. So, mm. you know, it was, and um, you know, it took me many many years to um, actually um, address that and try to deal with that emotionally because it affected me in many many ways. It affected I... my later relationships and so on. Yeah. And so, you know, when I was a young man, I wasn't even aware that. Um, I was in some ways you were being uh, very traumatized. So, the, so, right. so in writing, so um, writing that that was like a catharsis for you because this book, Homegirl, right. it's it's based yeah. on a a fourteen year old that's that's in the system, yeah. you know. And that was that's your right. your yeah. creative gifts found expression in both music, um, and writing yes. lyrics and the accompanying of music. How did you discover these gifts? I I needed an outlet, Janice. You know, I was um, I had all this bad stuff in my head. I had mm. all this angst. I had all this trauma, and um, it had to come out somewhere. And oh. so, at first, it came out in me writing bits of poetry, mm-hmm. me uh, keeping a diary about um, recalling the things that happened to me when I was a, a young boy, and so on. You know, remembering the um, the physical violence that. Um, impacted on me when I was very young and so I needed that to get it out of my system just to write about it just to release yeah. all those like, bad memories if you like yeah and I mean so my art is so important you know yes it, it definitely is I mean mm-hmm. you know I was so fortunate that I could that I found something that I was good at I mean even yeah. when I was at school I used to love um writing little uh cartoons and little um, comic strip stories and I used to like reading on my own because I spent so much time on my own. So I would read um, comics mainly back then when I was a young boy. Mm-hmm. And so it's only later on when I um, served time in prison that I found my love of reading again, you know, yeah. through the encouragement of this raster man who was, um, who was an avid reader. And I, mm-hmm. I remember him saying that um, I must read writers like C.L.R. James, uh, yes. John Steinbeck, uh, James Baldwin, all these great um, American and, and writers. It's in, and it's interesting that you would bring each one of them up because they bring something different to the table. I mean, because we're both West Indian, CLR, CLR James Wright, that is reflective yeah. of that. James Baldwin. You said James Baldwin yeah. or Richard, Richard White, anyway. Richard White, the fact that he spent time in Europe, but also yeah. he was able to capture the American black experience. And of course, Steinbeck, yeah. he, his stuff is, um, he's white, but he's ex- talking about, um, I, don't, I don't know if you read The Grapes of Wrath, where he talks yes, about I have, yeah. the experiences of people who are um, are in the hardship. So those were some That's really right. good people to get you, you know, yeah, um, get, get you started. going and understand the, the human experience, you know, the human experience from a, a West Indian perspective, a human experience from a, an American Absolutely. black perspective, the human experience from poor whites, you know, because they too Absolutely. have, not all white people have privileges. Well, 
Anyway, yes. that's another story. There yes. are other, I, others who recognize them and nurture them. Were there others? Or was it primarily through the books? Yes, it was through books, but um, music as well, because when I left prison, you know, I only served six months or so, I was hungry for um, to read about my experience or the experience that me and my fellow uh, se second generation Jamaicans uh, mm -hmm. suffered and went through in Brixton mm -hmm. with the racism of the police, you know, uh, yeah. a racist government, you know, the Margaret Thatcher government, in my opinion, was very racist. Very and so harsh. we were oppressed. We were oppressed minority living in South London. You know, mm -hmm. many of us were unemployed. Many of us, yeah. we felt that we weren't given the opportunity. So or I really wanted to read about that. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's I, interesting that you should point that out because you were directly involved in the Brixton riots of 81. And I think that right. was the, the tipping point. Wasn't that more yeah. or less the, the steam that brought on, you know, hey, we are British too and you're not acknowledging That's right. us. That's true. What got you involved, and what was the outcome for you um, during the Brixton that, line? Well, the outcome for me is that um, I was there on the very first day when the fighting started, mm -hmm. and um, for so long, for so long, the police had oppressed us. They had um, taken us into cells and beaten us up in cells and treated us mm -hmm. badly. But on this day, we decided no more. When we mm -hmm. saw them arrest an innocent uh, minicab driver, uh, there was just this strong reaction that, no, there's no way they're going to get away with that. So we managed to get um, to free the minicab driver. Uh, the police sent uh, um, one of their vans into the, into the street. And before we knew it, this van was rocked from side to side. It turned on its side. The officers were dragged out. And then there was an almighty fight that lasted for um three days and three nights, you know, bricks and yeah. burned in all that time. And for the first time, we saw the police actually running away from us, where for so long we've been running away we've from run them. Away so from it was us. very yeah. empowering at the time. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't in England at that time, but I do, yeah, I, um, I was in the States, and it, it, it must have been huge for it to actually, it was appearing on the news in the States. That's yeah. how much of an impact the Brixton riots. So it wasn't just a, a right. local thing, you know, say a local incident and um, that's that. No, no, it was actually on the news here in the States. So, yeah, All that's right. I wasn't, a, I was not you, aware of that. Um, yes. All I knew is that um, at last we kind of stood up and announced ourselves that they you know, the police and the government cannot treat us in that way. We're right. going to rise but, up. But, you know, we're Jamaicans. Many of us right. are Jamaicans. And so we yeah. have the, um, we have that um, kind of blood of resistance in us right. when right. we're treated but, badly. I, I think that's right. part of our DNA. It, I, and I really believe that. And also, it, 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 it has resonance with me, because normally I wouldn't pay attention, because remember, I'm, 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 I'm a child. I'm, I think I was about 10 or what, 81. I was in a teenager. No, I wasn't a teenager yet, actually. <laughs> but I remember it, and the yeah. reason why we saw it, um, you know, when it came on, you know, I remember my mom said, oh, you know, such and such is from Brixton. I wonder if anything's going on with them. And then that's the only, yeah. and then that, that kind of got me more interested oh yeah let's call them and, you know what i'm saying because we saw that and because we have that that brick the, the, the bricks in connection then it became more personal yeah. you know and then i remember my mom calling and finding out how was so and so you know yeah. and, you know just to find out what was going on you made the best of your accountability time by educating yourself what led you to this choice when you were in prison? As I, as I mentioned earlier, I shared a cell with a Russell man who was an avid mm -hmm. reader. And he encouraged mm -hmm. me. Uh, he used to say to me that um, you're not stupid. You have something to contribute. Don't believe what um, the people are saying about you. He, he used to say that I don't care about your um, circumstances that led you to this place. All I know is that I have a belief in you that you could do something good. And so mm. he encouraged me to read. He would give me texts and so on. And then I started to write my poetry and my lyrics. And he said, Alex, you're, you're incredibly talented. You really need to um, carry on with this when you leave mm -hmm. here. And so when I left prison, I used to write, um, I used to have a pencil and a notepad. And I used to walk around Brixton 
with your every day and that is when I uh, started my career really because my heroes at the time were DJs like Charlie Chaplin, Brigadier Jerry, <laughs> uh, the Lone Ranger, Boo Banton, all, all yeah. these DJs because we would yeah. get those cassette tapes. Yeah. I could go down Brixton Market and get those cassette tapes of live sound recordings. Uh-huh. You know, uh, of Metro Media, all those great, great sounds from Jamaica, and we would hear them. And you know, uh, and and that was my first love. Actually, I wanted to be an MC. I wanted to be a DJ. A and toaster. So, I think they call it uh, toasting, right? Yeah, yeah. I wanted to be a toaster, just like those guys in Jamaica. You know, Brigadier yeah. Jerry was my hero. Uh, yeah. You know, Yellow you know Man was my hero. People like that. Of course. Yeah, but you know how uh, how we stayed in touch with um, the Jamaican music is that on um, we had college radio. We, we our, um, yeah. on the weekend, the 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 um, you would just go to not we but the DJs. They would play on college radio, and that's the that's how I would get my Jamaican fix. I would say or reggae fix with the yeah. with the college radio stations on the weekend, and and that's how I learned about about all those people that you mentioned. So that was my introduction to Jamaican yeah. music. Not, not my introduction, but I guess staying grounded in just appreciation for the culture. There you discovered other talents, such as writing. And how did you come to that determination? Hey, you know, this, this will work for me. Well, after a while, I DJed, as you said earlier, under the name of Yard Man Irie. I had a, a, mm-hmm. a little a little sound system called Crucial Rocker, and we used to play in parties and youth clubs and, and blues dances. But I just loved the um, experience of writing. I loved mm. it so much. And so my lyrics kind of um, got longer. Mm-hmm. They kind of turned into short stories. And eventually mm-hmm. I felt, you know, I look back on my past again, and I was trying to process what happened to me. You know, mm-hmm. all the child trauma, all my experiences in a children's home, and so I thought the best place for me to deal with that was maybe to write a novel about it. Uh-huh. And so um, with encouraging friends, including Simeon, who was a Russian man who tutored me in prison, they really mm. encouraged me and said, yes, that's what you should do. So um, I started work on my first novel in 1994. I mean, the East Acre one? Days, I, was that your first was, one? This is Bricks and Rock. Oh. This is Bricks and Rock, my first okay. novel. And it, okay. and it's loosely based on um, a lot of what happened in my childhood, mm-hmm. you know, before I came to Brixton. And so that was my first novel. And at that time, I did not have a typewriter. All I had was um, a pen and uh, A4 notepad paper. But um, mm. eventually well, I managed to type it up. All those people that you mentioned, Steinbeck, Richard Wright, and all of they yeah. don't have uh, tapes and stuff. They, they, they put right. pen to paper, yeah. and, and they're still, and think about this, their works are still valued. You know, I mean, you yes, know, you go absolutely. to university, and um, they have classes about them. You go to high school, um, same thing. And then just because yeah. I'm, I, I enjoy reading, after I was introduced to, say, one, one Richard Wright book, then, of course, I had to go read yeah. the other one. You know what I'm saying? And even you, you know, it's like, oh, okay, yeah. Uh, because I, I love learning about Jamaicans in the diaspora and how they yeah, were, they retained their culture and how and how it resonated. Because, of course, I have the American, Jamaican, American experience. You have the Jamaican British experience. What were the commonalities? Yeah. And, it, and it's just a wonderful way for us to um, network is. and just just basically reinforce our identity too, you know, where we're coming from. Absolutely. It's so, yes. it's so important because I will go into schools and um, I speak to the children and, you know, London's very diverse. You have many, mm-hmm. many communities from Africa, from all over the world. Yeah. And I, was, I would ask um, any uh, Jamaicans in the school, like they could be um, the daughters and sons of a, or, or granddaughters and, and grandsons of Jamaicans mm-hmm. who first came over here in the 60s or 50s. Mm-hmm. And I'd yeah. ask them, what do you know about your grandparents or your great-grandparents? And they couldn't really ask me because they weren't instructed in that way. So I thought it's very necessary to yeah. um, remind them that they come well, from uh, Jamaica and all the history that and the rich, um, you know, uh, that's behind that. So that's one of the reasons why I wrote a novel called Island Songs, which is about mm-hmm. my parents' generation, you know, uh, yeah. living in Jamaica in a country, moving to Kingston before 
coming to the UK. And so yes. I think and it's very important because everyone should know about their history. Everyone should right. know and take pride in that as well. Yes. And so that's one of the reasons why I wrote East of Acre Lane because it was a defining experience for so many of us living in Brixton and South London Brixton. at the time. Yes. And uh, when I was looking in the bookshops, I couldn't find anything coming close to that kind of experience. I mean, right. we did have Linton Quasi Johnson. That hey, was poem, that's my it? guy. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. That's right. And I'm sure he impacted we had him. you. Did, 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 oh, did absolutely. Did you do any of his toe scenes? Yes, of course. Oh, yeah, yeah. Wonderful. You know, he used to live not too far from me. He is just honest. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. You know? So that is... You are... That, yeah, Linton is all we had, you know. So I wanted something to be there in fiction, where you could oh. take out a book and you could read about the experiences of what my generation had to go through, mm -hmm. uh, living in yeah. South London at that point, you know, with yeah. that whole Jamaican um, experience and so and forth. What, what I, and like I think it's about, very interesting, very exciting. What I like about Linton, if you juxtapose the, um, what he was writing about, um, and then you yeah. juxtapose to what was happening in the Bronx, when, where rap, yeah. which which was came from, um, was created by Cool Herc, which is of Jamaican. It was storytelling yes. to music in an in a, in an economically depressed community. Linton is there in Brixton, storytelling music, yeah. economically depressed, and how you make and how you work it out, you know. And then there was that. Yeah, I Austin. have. I have so nephews and nieces in um, in the U.S. living in uh -huh. D.C., living in Florida, and I'm always mm -hmm. telling them that hip hop because they're fans of hip hop. I say yeah. hip hop was really originated by Jamaicans in New York. Jamaican, cool work, yes. Do you see how we're such That's... talented people? And you know, people don't. Yeah. You, you, you think they're hidden, and then and if you don't know your history, then you'll have. I actually had an, an experience when this this girl, white girl, Spanish. She had nerve right. to tell me that, oh no, um, um, the Jamaicans didn't do that. I just thought it was her idea of rap and all that is, is um, um, SoundCloud Mafia and 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 Eminem. And all. I'm oh, like, no. no, 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 these people copied us, you know. But That's and then right. when you point and when you're able to point these things out, you're not just talking. You're able to back up what you say. It's such a good feeling. Yeah. Not that you're trying to what umphlet, but give credit to the people who created the genre. Oh, absolutely, you know? and that's very important. And also, it, um, it was it was Jamaican sound systems that first came out with the 12-inch vinyl record, you know, the 45 mm. long player. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was a Jamaican thing. Yeah. Not a, a hip-hop yeah. thing. That originated in Jamaica. Right, yeah. And there, so there was people a need to know that history. Yeah, yeah. and, and it's good that, that some so. people are actually... Um, doing these documentaries. The only thing I fear is that when those that yeah. particular documentary that um that had that brought that up, it's not a Jamaican that's doing it. It's other people who are doing it, and that is the fear because if somebody else is telling your story and not you, yeah, they they may have intentions which is to skew a narrative that yeah. isn't true or to demean you and elevate them. Remember, I told you about how that's that right. the girl was talking about, oh, no, Eminem is the rappers and all this nonsense. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know? It's a very, it's a very, very important it's, point. So it's, part of it's, why I write is because we need to claim our own stories again. Exactly. You know, uh, and, you know, and that's we, why we, we cannot love... Allow, yes, we cannot allow mm -hmm. other people to write our stories. To write we need your to story. claim and own our stories. Yes. So that's what right. I do. That's, I, that's, that is my main motivation. I mean, mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm, I'm leaping on now, but I've just um, completed a book about um, the Jamaican uh, slave warrior, uh, Taki. Ah. You know, I, so we're gonna, I, I found Chris out about him. Chris and I will have to have you back on ago. when when that one goes. But let's talk Absolutely. about Homegirl. Homegirl is yeah, one okay. of your fine works. What are the three yeah. essentials that you want the reader to get from this work? Um, my first motivation was is that um, I've been hearing all these stories about pop stars like Madonna and so on and, you know, uh, fostering or adopting black children. Mm -hmm. And I always felt that um, there's so many black families that could be a safe space for any child growing up. And so yeah. I wanted to show the reader that 
a black family is a safe space where any kind of girl, whether it's white, whether she's black, whether she's mixed race or whatever, didn't really matter, is a safe space for a child to learn about life. To and so nurturing. that was my motivation in writing Home Girl because we've been told so much that, um, you know, we get these stories, we call them white savior stories where Ugh. the white person comes to the rescue of a black child or, or whatever. Or so I, I wanted to show the other side to that. Yeah, of course. And then, and, that. and then let's be honest with each other. A lot of the culture that's going on now, you know, you, well, yeah. we give praises to Africa because that's the root of it all. But yeah. um, when you think of American culture, the group that really gives American culture to the world are the American black, you know, yeah. you know, with the uh, with the style and the swag, or even yeah. um, and then let's say if you do Caribbean culture, um, Jamaicans have a a domination. A lot of it comes from the Jamaican, I guess, genre. Yeah. Um, if that if if that's the correct word, yeah. You yeah. chose I mean, girl. the influences. Yeah. Influence. Yes, the influence is incredible worldwide. I mean, yes. when I go on holiday to various places in the globe, where it could be New Zealand, uh, well, you know, wherever I traveled, whether it could be Tunisia. I'll, I'll tell you one story. I went to Tunisia a number of years ago, and um, I, I, I didn't stay in the hotel resort. I went real deep into Tunisia, and I came across a bazaar, one of these markets that they have. And everything mm-hmm. there, almost every other stall, they were selling um, a Bob Marley badge, a Bob <laughs> Marley hat, a Bob Marley yeah. CD. And, and, and that, you, you don't see that. You, you don't see Beatles or anything. You, you, you see the Jamaican influence globally. Right. And globally. Even, and, then, and so and even, we need to celebrate that. Yeah. And the fact that you mentioned the Beatles, um, a lot of people don't realize that a lot of the Beatles were impacted by American blacks. Of course Indeed. they were, yeah. You know? so Yeah, absolutely. That's the outgrowth of it. So we have yeah. to give um, praises to that. You know, as we close, are there any plans yeah. for your fine work in media? I remember when I saw Island Song in the in the yeah as a movie it that was turned into a movie and i was very pleased with that i was like oh, i love this you know and then right when i when they announced that it was going to be on i had to i went back to my island song book and reread it before i right. watched the movie. okay so do we have any plans for this homegrown yes novel? I've, got, I've got some news for you um uh, one of my uh, young adult books, Conkton Nights, is being adapted into a stage play which starts touring um, mm-hmm. early next year in the UK. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, if any of you or your listeners or, or, or come to the UK, they can look forward to that next uh, next February 2020. Um, mm-hmm. Also, there's plans for um, my first book, Bricks and Rock, to be turned into a feature film. So mm-hmm. we're, um, we're almost... We're almost there. I'd love to make an announcement um, sometime soon. And also, here's an exclusive for you. There's going to be um, a drama about my young life in Brixton, and that will be um, and that will be broadcast on the BBC. And in the US, it'll be broadcast on Amazon Prime next next fall. Wonderful. You are a man on the move. And we need yeah. to see. So, what about Homegirl? Anything, anything for Homegirl yet? Homegirl, it's it's early days yet, but there is some interest about um, a production company here in the UK uh, adapting the whole of my Cronkin series because there's so far five books in that series, and mm-hmm. so um, they're thinking about turning the series into some kind of television serial show uh, with um, with say ten or twelve episodes, something like that. So we're trying to work that out. And so that would be very exciting. So there's so much to do. And as I said earlier, you know, it's time for our stories to start flourishing now. To be told. And, and, and to be told by the original. Told. Yes. Because yes, it's absolutely. one thing to tell a story. It's another to tell it um, from a place of authenticity. Because I think yes. it, it, it has That's much more right. resonance. Alex, we Absolutely. so thank you for spending some time with us. To learn more about Chris Daly, visit Digital to Grow. That's digital with the number two grow dot com. To learn more about Jamaican diaspora, visit Jamaican diaspora dot com. And to learn about Alex Wheatley, visit Alex dot com. Bye, Alex.
Thanks. Bye, Janice. Thank you very much for having me. Bye. Bye. Bye.